So, during World War II, there was a United States soldier who was flying behind enemy lines, and he was going to do a night parachute drop behind enemy lines. And he dropped out the airplane, he was in his parachute, and all of a sudden a little breeze came up and moved him off course. And he ended up stuck in some trees, high up, a couple hundred feet up in the air. And luckily, he landed near a Dominican priory in the woods. And some Dominican friars were walking back at night from preaching. And they heard this voice up in the trees. They couldn't see him, but they heard this guy kind of rustling up there. And the guy in the tree heard these guys on the ground. He's like, oh, help, help, I'm stuck in the tree. And the Dominicans looked up, trying to figure out what's going on. They huddled together, consulted Aquinas, and then they said, you need a knife and a ladder. And the man in the tree said, you're Dominicans, aren't you? <laughs> and they said, yes, how did you know that? And he, respond, and he responded, well, what you say is, True, but it's not very helpful. <laughs> so we'll see, if I, we'll see if I can avoid that Dominican tendency tonight. It's kind of an abstract topic. Um, and please get, uh, keep questions to the end. I'll, I, I'll get derailed very quickly. Um, <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> Fitting in has been one of the greatest struggles for Catholics in the United States. And this struggle is not based so much on our diverse ethnic backgrounds, our veneration of statues and relics, or our tendency to enjoy the full bounty of creation's fruits, but rather on our comprehensive view of the world which defies conven convenient classification within the American political system. Looking at the church's teachings on economics, ecology, the family, the meaning and value of human life, the obedience due to the pope and the bishops in communion with him, the role of government and law, marriage, death, war, immigration, the treatment of the poor and imprisoned, and countless other topics, we see that not a single American political party or representative or ideology effectively comprises the Catholic worldview. Catholics, therefore, regrettably, find themselves often forced to vote for parties or for representatives who promote some items in line with the church and in line with the gospel, but not all. And besides that, acts of legislation, such as the contraceptive mandate of the Affordable Care Act, more and more frequently attempt to force Catholics and Catholic institutions to contradict essential moral principles. The recent fury over Indiana's Religious Freedom Restoration Act also reveals that it's not just the Catholic Church, but religion and religious freedom in general that are becoming at odds with the American cultural and political landscape. A struggle is increasingly growing between religion and law, with the upper hand tilting to secular interpretations. Given our history in the United States, and given the current situation we find ourselves in today, it behooves us, both as citizens and as Catholics, to grow more acquainted with our own comprehensive worldview, the Christian worldview, enlightened by the gospel, which allows men and women to become saints and to act as leaven in the midst of a wicked and depraved generation. Instead of allowing secularism to define terms and dictate what we as Christians can or cannot do, we must arm ourselves with our own terms and understanding of truth and seek the liberty to live the life of virtue and grace. This talk tonight, therefore, attempts to offer an insight into the significant relation between law and religion through the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. This significant issue affects politicians and civilians alike who seek to live their faith within the context of American society. Here's the caveat, though. This talk, however, is not meant to address specific problems in the American legal system. What is it not meant to do? Address specific topics. So keep that in mind. We will not be using St. Thomas 
to argue, for example, whether or not a Christian baker can make a gay wedding cake. We're avoiding that. <laughs> and we're not going to argue whether or not churches de deserve special tax exemptions. We're not talking about that. We tonight are using St. Thomas to provide an overarching view of reality that links the legal and religious spheres of human action together through the metaphysical concept of order. So once again, we are using St. Thomas Aquinas to provide an overarching view of reality that links together the religious and legal spheres of human action through the metaphysical concept of order. What we should take home tonight is that if we have a grasp of what order is in the universe, and what it means for human beings individually and socially to be well-ordered, then it becomes clear that law and religion, as defined by St. Thomas, cannot and should not conflict. To reach this conclusion, we will examine three things. I'll use this laser. First, we will look at order in St. Thomas Aquinas, as applied to God and creation. We're getting a big picture of order. So if you hear order a lot, that's just what's going to happen. You're going to hear a lot about order. This discussion will show the harmony between law and religion. Understanding order and its relation to law and religion, however, does not provide us with a ready-made solution to the problems that Catholics face, but with a challenge. The challenge, as Catholics, to live and act in such a way that through us, the grace of Christ may continually transform, heal, and strengthen the order of the world. Part 1. Order. Most people, I, I assume, have an intuitive grasp of what it means for something to be ordered. But where you ask them to define order, they might have a hard time. Order is a word that appears to change its guise depending on how you use it. It seems easier for us to understand order by explaining what is not ordered. We say that a machine that fails to work is out of order. A lowly rifleman who speaks impertinently to his commanding officer is likewise being out of order. A room with books, clothes, and furniture strewn about in a disheveled manner is not ordered. When following the instructions for making a store-bought do-it-yourself propane grill, if you do step 17b, attaching the mooring coupler to the igniter unit housing, before you do step 8f, securing the upper front plate to the main input valve, then you have done your work out of order, and you'll soon have an explosion. A man who becomes sexually aroused by smelling other people's socks is likewise said to have a disordered sexual desire. But hey, who am I to judge? It seems fascinating that one word, order, could be used to describe so many different things in apparently different ways. The multifarious nature of the concept of order was not lost to St. Thomas. One scholar notes, quote, the word order is that kind of word that St. Thomas finds impossible to use in exactly the same sense each time he uses it. It does have different shades of meaning, although there are general characteristics of order that can be pointed out, end quote. There are several places in his corpus where St. Thomas dedicates a considerable amount of time to trying to define order and describe its general characteristics. We will not be going into that, thank goodness, but I will just give you some basic overviews of how he uses order. We will limit ourselves tonight to speak about order in three distinct but necessarily related ways. We will order our discussion of order. For our purposes tonight, we will distinguish between hierarchical order, 
horizontal order, and the order of harmony. These are not the terms that Aquinas uses himself, but are used tonight to help clarify all the different ways that he uses order. We will apply these three types of order to the constitution, direction, and organization of the universe. We will see in this section that the hierarchical order of the universe determines the horizontal order of the universe, and the two in relation together constitute order of harmony. So about the first. We can talk about order, first of all, as establishing groups in hierarchies. For example, in biological taxonomy, it's convenient, there is a group called an order. It's below a, below a class. For example, humans and honey badgers are both in the, the order mammalia. However, humans are then divided into the order primate, and honey badgers are then divided into carnivora, along with bears and wolves. For St. Thomas and the predominant Christian tradition, the universe exists as a hierarchical order, like a pyramid or a pay scale. With God at the highest point in the hierarchy, the order of the universe ascends by degree of how much a being may participate in and reflect the divine goodness, by how much something is like God. While this idea is a bit uncommon for us today, since we've been influenced by secular strains of philosophy that promote ontological egalitarianism, the concept of a great hierarchical chain of being was, as Arthur Lovejoy puts it, quote, the conception of the plan and structure of the world which, through the Middle Ages and down to the late 18th century, many philosophers, most men of science, and indeed most educated men were to accept without question. End quote. It was only with the historically recent rise of secular humanism, utilitarianism, deism, and, and the libidinous dissatisfaction with the Christian worldview by Enlightenment and modern thinkers that the hierarchical order of the universe was rejected. More recent Protestant scholars, such as Rudolf Bultmann, sought to purge the Christian faith of this classical worldview thinking that it made the gospel unintelligible to the sensibilities of modern man who lived in democratic states and received information from television. This rejection, which undergirds much of the political philosophy of our own country, is not a true progress of knowledge, wisdom, and truth, but, as Dr. Ed Fazer describes it, it is a nightmarish toboggan ride down into the dark bowels of modernity's version of Plato's cave. End quote. If we Catholics are to recover our place in the world, it must begin by a recovery of the truly Christian worldview, a hierarchical universe where God is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. For St. Thomas, we see that the universe exists as a hierarchical order when we reflect upon the various natures and essences of things. In one sense, everything in the universe is equal because everything depends on God for existence, which Aquinas calls essay. But in another sense, things are unequal and can be more or less great depending upon what they are, their nature or their essence. As John Gia summarizes, Thomas shows that all creatures have essay by participation in the essay of God. But what makes each creature unique is its particular mode of participation in the essay of God based upon its diverse nature. It is through the vast diversity of natures, of essences, that we see the incredible hierarchical structure of the universe, like a giant mosaic that one must step far back in order to see as a recognizable whole. And how is this hierarchical order arranged? What is the scale? It is ordered by how much a thing may reflect God's goodness through its actions. Different essences are able to do different things. And the more an essence is able to do, the more it is like God for whom nothing is impossible. And the more a creature does the things that it is capable of doing, the more it is in act. And the more it is like God who is pure act itself. 
So by looking at the essences of created things, we are able to classify them in a hierarchical order based upon what they are capable of doing. At the bottom of the ontological chain, we find inorganic materials like rocks, bits of dirt or raw chemicals, who are capable simply of existing, taking up space and observing the various laws of physics. Next up the chain, we have single-celled organisms and basic life forms such as slime mold. On top of existing, taking up space and observing the laws of physics, these basic life forms have metabolism, homeostasis. They're able to grow and reproduce. Next up the chain, we have animals who not only do what rocks and slime can do, but have a greater range of motion and are capable of greater interaction with their environment in the pursuit of food, safety, and reproduction. Next up, we have humans, who can not only do what rocks, slime, and animals can do, but are endowed with reason, through which they can form abstract thoughts, can see and recognize order in the universe, can think about thinking, and can know God vaguely through great intellectual effort. Higher than the humans are the angels, both good and bad, who beyond rocks, slime, animals, and humans are unencumbered by a body and so can travel at the speed of thought. They have tremendous power over the physical world. They can know things at a level far beyond that of humans and behold God with astounding and frightening clarity. And then there is God himself who is purely capable all the perfections and all the capabilities of lesser beings find their source and their summit in him. Everything that strives to exist is aching upwards towards God from whom all existence flows down. This order of the universe is a fundamental reality established by God, knowable by reason, and made clear by faith. We should share the wonder of the psalmist as we behold this order When I see your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you arranged, what is man that you should keep in mind, the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him little less than the angels. With glory and honor you crowned him. Give him power over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet, all of them, sheep and oxen, yes, even the cattle of the fields, birds of the air and fish of the sea that make their way through the waters. Through the actions proper to each essence, individual beings placed within the hierarchy of creation themselves become particular instantiations of God's goodness. The diversity of creation is set in a hierarchical order arranged by ways that reflect the, the, the thing, arranged by ways that things reflect and participate in the divine life and goodness. Aquinas notes that, quote, the universe would not be perfect if only one grade of goodness were found in things, end quote. That is, if the entire universe were filled only with honey badgers, then God's glory could not really be reflected. The honey it could only be reflected in one way, the honey badger way. Thus, with a universe full of different things, God's goodness is reflected in many ways. The universe exists as a whole, comprising many different levels of goodness, depending on the capabilities that make the various essences of things distinct from one another. Before diversity became a 20th century buzzword, Aquinas recognized that the diversity and multiplicity of creatures better reflected God's goodness than if only one creature existed. God willed to make a universe ordered in its parts by various grades of goodness, so that his own goodness would be more fully revealed and shared by his creation. Next, horizontal order. The second way we can talk about order in St. Thomas Aquinas is that of actions being ordered to an end. Actions ordered to an end, which I call horizontal order because it suggests kind of a timeline of events or action. For example, the action of a carpenter on wood is ordered to making a chair. The actions of a baseball coach are ordered to winning games. 
the action of a brewer is ordered to making beer. Yes. Thank you. I think you have a new job now. <laughs> you are ordered to a new act. <laughs> when an intelligent being performs an action, it is ordered to some definite end or goal. When we ask someone, why did you do that? We are trying to figure out what they were trying to order their action to. I was trying to help. I was trying to burn down a building, something. And since God is an intelligent being, and he acts through making the hierarchical order of creation, then this action of creation must be ordered to some definite end. That is to say, in creating the universe, God has some order in mind, some plan leading towards a goal. Aquinas distinguishes two aspects of this kind of order in the universe. The first is that God knows the order, which is called providence. And the second is that he carries out the order, which is divine government. God knows the order of creation, and this plan is unchangeable since it exists within his mind, which is perfect and cannot change. Since everything exi that exists depends on God, everything depends on his plan. Just as the chair depends on the carpenter, and the baseball victory on the coach, and the beer on the brewer, so everything, past, present, and future, and possible past, present, and future, depends on the order, the plan established in God. I like to think of providence as a great current of a river in which everything is caught. Aquinas notes that God doesn't just know the plan, but he also carries it out. This is called God's government of creation. Aquinas states in the Summa Contra Gentiles, quote, to govern a thing is nothing but to impose order on it. Since God imposes order on the universe, he therefore governs it. As the psalmist says, the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. Built into the very essence of creation is an inherent order placed by God who governs all things wisely. This wise ordering is recognized in the tradition as a special work of Christ, who is the Logos, the Word, Reason, who was in the beginning with God and through whom all things were made. The mystical contemplation of order reveals the presence of Christ who draws all creation to himself. But how does God move everything according to his plan of providence? How does he govern everything? He governs creation by moving it in an orderly way through providence towards a single, concrete, specific end. This government of things towards an end, however, occurs according to the specific nature and capabilities of the things governed. God does not move honey badgers like he moves humans, but he moves honey badgers as honey badgers, and he moves humans as humans. Thus, the execution of God's government for beings in the lower rung of creation's hierarchical order, such as rocks, plants, and animals, occurs by such creatures simply acting according to their natures. Simply by being, by rolling down hills when pushed, or by forming mountains, rocks obey God's command. Simply by being, by eating cobras, and by napping in their burrows, honey badgers obey God's command. Just as a good craftsman knows how to use well each distinct tool to get the job done, whether lathe, flathead screwdriver, or parrot-nosed plier, so God knows how to use each being in the universe to fulfill his plan. Humans, however, participate in providence and are governed by God, particularly through the use of properly human actions. Human acts are to be distinguished from acts of a human. Human acts are different than acts of a human. As Christopher Kazor clarifies, quote, Thomas draws the distinction so important in Thomistic ethics between acts of a human, actus hominis, and human acts, actus humani. 
human action proceeds from that in the person which is distinctly human, namely reason and will. Hence, distinctly human acts are those that proceed from reason and will, such as shooting a free throw, telling a joke, or pondering a theorem. On the other hand, acts of a human being are acts properly attributed to the human person, but not insofar as he or she is a human person. An example of an act of a human would be yawning, stretching, breathing, or chewing food. These actions are shared with honey badgers who do the same things. It only happens to be a human doing them. Humans are distinct from honey badgers in that our reason and will allow us to have mastery over our own actions. And thus, we may make truly human acts. This is especially significant for St. Thomas since he defines human acts as moral acts. Morality is based on human actions, proceeding from the will and reason. Our moral human acts for St. Thomas are what allow us to cooperate with God in his order of creation towards the end. Thus, the psalmist exhorts us, be not like horse and mule, unintelligent. With our reason, we can grasp good and evil, and even know the plan of providence in a certain way. With our will, we can choose our actions and seek to follow God's order of creation, or not. God moves us towards the end of creation through causing us to have free judgment over our actions. God forces us to be free. Humans, therefore, are not exempt from providence because we have free will, but we participate in it through the distinct human exercise of reason and will to pursue the final end that God has in store for the universe. The attainment of this end by human, exercising reason and will, is known as happiness. Third order. Any third order Dominicans here? Okay, we're talking about the third order. Uh, had to throw it out there. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> if we ask the question, what is the universe ordered to? Second, the surprise answer is order. Yes, it got that interesting. <laughs> the goal that God has in mind, according to St. Thomas, is to have a universe where everything that exists, exists to its highest degree, manifesting to the greatest extent possible God's own goodness. This is the third way we will talk about order in St. Thomas Aquinas. This is the kind of order where things are in right relationship in right place. They're in the right way. Thus, when a, clean, a room is clean and tidy, it is called well-ordered. When a society is peaceful, it is called well-ordered. So the final goal of the universe is an order, a harmony, where everything exists perfectly according to God's plan. God creates the universe as a hierarchical order and he moves and governs it in an orderly way towards a final order. If we remember that every intelligent being acts for an end, then the next step is to recognize that the end has the appearance of good. The chair appears good to the carpenter who makes it. The victory appears good to the coach who coaches the team. The beer appears good to the brewer, of course. To say that every agent acts for an end is to say that every agent acts for a good. And this good is something that satisfies or completes the action of the agent. But what could satisfy God? He is perfect. He lacks nothing. He is completely happy in himself. Aquinas argues that the end towards which God acts is himself. Since God is the greatest good, then God always acts with himself as the goal, because he is the greatest good. And so when God acts by providence and the government of creation, 
He is acting to bring all things to himself because he is the greatest good. The end towards which God acts is God. Aquinas therefore argues that the goal of the universe is for creation to attain God. When the universe as a whole arrives at the ultimate end of reflecting to the highest degree possible the goodness of God, then we may say that the universe is completely ordered. When all the parts of the universe exist perfectly as images of God, then the universe as a whole reflects God's goodness perfectly. This is the new heaven and the new earth seen by John in Revelation. But how do things attain God? Aquinas argues that things attain God when they imitate God to the best of their ability. And how do things imitate God? By being perfect and by being good. Unlike honey badgers who attain God simply by being the best little honey badger they can be, humans attain God in a specifically human way, according to human perfection. Since human actions stem from reason and will, the human attainment of God, the perfection of the human, will result from the use of reason and will. All things are ordered to attain God, but humans attain God by knowing and loving God with all their mind, heart, soul, and strength. The end of knowing and loving God is the absolute perfection of the human being. The name applied to this perfection by Aquinas is happiness. Aquinas argues that neither wealth, honor, fame, power, bodily good, pleasure, good of the soul, or any created good can captivate and perfect the human in true happiness. Happiness is reserved only for the human being who beholds God with the full strength and vivacity of their being. He says, Final, perfect, final and perfect happiness can consist in nothing else than the vision of the divine essence. But, like an archer, we will never hit this end. We will never hit this target unless we aim for it. And we cannot grasp it unless we are aided. This is the blessing and the curse of possessing a rational nature after the fall. By looking at the order of the universe, we see that it is a created in a hierarchy of beings who through various degrees and differing abilities reflect the divine goodness. First, we see, second, that the universe is ordered to an end by God and that he moves things to that end through providence and government. And we see that once all things attain God, As the highest good, the universe is ordered as an integral whole in harmony with the divine plan. The hierarchical order determines the horizontal order. And the together aim towards the final order of harmony, which Aquinas calls the common good. As Samuel Beer aptly sums Aquinas' conception of the universe, quote, The cosmos has been created and was governed by God, the perfect being. It consisted of an immense number of orders of lesser beings, angels, men, animals, vegetable life, and inanimate things, down to the last dregs of being, which were hardly anything at all. Although normally diverse, it was not a mere aggregate or miscellany, but a cosmos, because these orders were distinguished from one another by degrees of being of value, of utility, and of authority, which at the same time join them together as complementary parts of a harmonious whole. Hierarchic, corporatist, and organic, this cosmos was natural, but above all, divine, unified by God's love for and providence over his created world, and by his created world's love for and obedience to him. Adapting Lincoln's definition, we may characterize God's regime as government of the Creator, by the Creator, and for the Creator. With this hierarchy, with this overarching view of the universe and order in mind, we will now turn to look at how a human, in particular, participates 
in this divine order through religion and through law. How do humans fit into the grand scheme of things? What is our place in the cosmos? As we saw, humans occupy a special place in the hierarchical order of the universe. They are above animals, but below angels. They have mastery over their actions through reason and will. They can know to a degree not just that there is a divine plan, but even sort of what that plan entails. Due to their rational nature, humans may achieve happiness by knowing and loving the Lord who guides, creates, governs, and governs them. Because of what they are, humans are ordered through providence in a special way, distinct from rocks and honey badgers. The special way is that humans are ordered to the end, not just from without, but from within as well. And this is where the realms of law and religion coincide for St. Thomas Aquinas. Here, we begin to see how, through an understanding of the order of the universe, law and religion dovetail together. Law, for St. Thomas, is the external principle that moves humans to the end. It's external. Religion is the internal principle by which humans move themselves in cooperation with God to the end. Logs external, religion is internal. We can now take a closer look at law and religion with respect to order in human life. We'll begin with religion. In the Prima Secundae of the Summa Theologiae, St. Thomas treats of the general principles involved in how human beings are ordered to their final end of happiness. He begins by treating the person in as much as he is the principal of his own actions, as having free will and control of his actions. This treatment is of the internal principles of human actions, which either lead to good or evil acts. These are the powers of the soul and habits. St. Thomas then treats the external principles of human action. Those that lead to good are law and grace. Those that lead to evil is the devil and his temptations. The point being made by St. Thomas in the Prima Secundae is that a human being reaches God, reaches happiness, not as one forced from the outside, nor as one in complete autonomy over his own actions by sheer force of will. This directly contradicts many of the moral philosophies that the world currently presents to us. As Servé Pinker laments, quote, since the Renaissance, we have been victimized by a supposed dichotomy, a conflict between man and God, freedom and grace, the natural and the supernatural. It is as if giving to one required taking from the other. End quote. This dichotomy is absolutely false according to St. Thomas's account of reality. The order to happiness is a cooperation between the internal depths of a person's being and the external, eternal plan of God. St. Thomas's treatment of religion is one that appears initially puzzling to most modern people. We are used to thinking of religion as an institution, or a set of beliefs, or a thing. For example, there are people who describe themselves as spiritual, but not religious, meaning that they don't go to a particular institution. Religion, for St. Thomas Aquinas, however, is not a thing that one subscribes to. Religion is not something you believe in. Religion, for St. Thomas, is an action. Religion is something you do. Religion, for St. Thomas, is a virtue associated with justice, which he describes as chief among the moral virtues. Precipua inter virtutes morales. And the reason why he gives religion the highest place among the moral virtues is that it orders man to God. Ordinat omnum ad Deum. Let's skip ahead here. You all understand that virtues are good habits. Have you heard that before? Okay. A habit is a habit as described by Aquinas is an order. 
<laughs> There's order everywhere in Aquinas. A habit is an order to act in a certain way. For exa- and habits exist within certain powers of the soul. For example, for example, I have the rational power of the soul most of the time. And I have the habit of using it. Habits make use of certain powers and order the powers to act in certain ways. These habits, this order to action can increase or decrease depending on use. And these habits can be called good or bad. There are moral qualities to habits. Since actions are what perfect a being by realizing its essence, then actions that are in accord with the essence of the being are good. Actions that are contrary or degenerative to the perfection and realization of a being's nature are bad. Habits, therefore, which are ordered to actions that are in accord with a nature, which perfect the operation and being of a creature, are specifically good habits. Since, as we recall, the perfection of things through their proper actions is the end toward which God orders creation, then good habits, which order agents to act according to their natures, are essential for completing the order of the universe. This is especially so after the fall, where our powers of the soul, particularly the concupiscible passions, have become disordered and rebellious against the superior power of the intellect, like disobedient servants who turn to rule over their own master. Good habits, for St. Thomas, are called virtues. A virtue, as discussed in the Prima Secundae, question 55, is a ordered disposition of the soul. Ipsa virtus as quedam dispositio ordinata in anima. It's an ordered disposition of the soul insofar as the acts of the soul are either ordered properly to one another or ordered to things outside the soul. There's so much order. Later on in question 64, Aquinas reiterates, the nature of virtue is that it should order man to good. Ordinat hominum ad bonum. Virtue is an ordered action. Virtue is an ordered action. And we can take that in all the senses of the, the word order. When a human acts virtuously, they are acting with respect to the hierarchical order of the powers of the soul. When a human acts virtuously, he or she is acting is properly participating in the order of the universe. When a human acts virtuously, he or she is acting properly towards the end, which the specific power of the soul is intrinsically ordered. When a human acts virtuously, the soul itself becomes a well-ordered harmony, since the actions of the soul are meant to complement one another in the pursuit of goodness. Since virtues are good habits, and habits reside in the soul with respect to powers, we distinguish virtues by what powers they perfect. With regard to the rational power, we distinguish virtues like prudence, understanding, and wisdom. With regard to the power of the body to seek pleasure and avoid pain, known as the the appetitive power, we may distinguish virtues such as temperance, chastity, or fortitude. With regard to the power of the intellect to desire good things and to move us towards them, which Aquinas defines as the will, we may speak of the virtues of hope, charity, and justice. The virtue of justice, in particular, is the virtue whereby our will is ready to render to other people what we owe them. Justice is a social virtue. Aquinas defines justice as, quote, a habit whereby a man renders to each one his due by a constant and perpetual will. However, Aquinas notes that there are some people to whom we can never fully give their due. We can never really establish equal friendship with them. This inequality among humans is not due to different human natures, but rather to various levels of dignity, importance, and function. There are people who are above us in hierarchy, such as our parents. Aquinas therefore distinguishes particular virtues that fall under the category of justice, but can never truly give justice completely. These are called the potential parts of the virtue of justice. Second part of the second part, question 80 and following. 
The potential parts of justice include the virtue of observance, whereby we show reverence and honor to our earthly rulers and those of high dignity, such as nobles, kings, or bishops. Another potential part of justice is the virtue of piety, whereby we show reverence and honor to our parents. How can we ever repay them for giving us life? Last but not least, we have the potential part of the virtue of justice, whereby we attempt to show reverence and honor to God. This is the virtue of religion. Man, through his ability to reason his way conclusively to the fact that there must be a God, is able to have a relationship with God naturally through that knowledge, as weak as it is. And just as man shows honor to his parents or his king, who are superior to him, so a man honors God. That is why, for example, St. Thomas argues that it should be completely obvious that people offer sacrifice to God. It's part, he, he says, of natural reason. Because religion is a natural virtue, those who lack it are missing an integral part of basic human morality. They are lacking in what it means to be a human. But religion does more than simply show God honor. The virtue of religion points to the very meaning of the human moral life itself. Aquinas explained this by relating religion to <laughs> order. The very first article of Aquinas' question on religion considered in itself states that religion denotes an order to God. Religio propre importat ordinum ad deum. Religion's proper domain is not only to worship God immediately through the interior acts of devotion and prayer, but to command all other actions of human life that they may be done for God. Because religion directs man to God, orders man to God, who is the ultimate end of human life, then it is responsible for directing all the means and actions of human life to that single end. Aquinas says, religion has two kinds of acts. Some are its proper and immediate acts, which it elicits and by which man is ordered to God alone. For instance, sacrifice, adoration, and the like. But it has other acts, which it produces through the medium of the virtues which it commands, directing them to the honor of God. Thus, religion is not limited to formal worship of God, but it expands into every aspect of human life. Our work, our acts of mercy, the time devoted to our family, our study, and our recreation, any virtuous task can become a religious action if it is done for God. By practicing the virtue of religion, by doing actions for God, by showing him reverence, we become ordered to God. This order is, first of all, hierarchical. When we worship God, what we are essentially doing is recognizing that we are inferior to him. He is superior to us. You are God and I am not, is what worship says. That's why Aquinas says, quote, It belongs to religion to show reverence to one, to one God under one aspect, namely as the first principle of creation and the gover governor of all things. By recognizing God's supremacy, we place ourselves in the proper position for human beings within the order of the cosmos. In this way, religion prevents the vice of pride, which tries to move us up in the hierarchy. And at the same time, it prevents lust and gluttony, which try to lower us in the hierarchy. But as we saw, hierarchical order determines horizontal order. Since religion concerns God, and God is the end and goal of all creation, religion concerns moving us towards the final end. Worship is not a static recognition of God. It moves us to God. By growing in the virtue of religion, by intentionally doing things for God to show him honor, we move closer to him. Not in hierarchy, but horizontally, as our end. This movement is perfected and achieved only through Christian religion, which imbues the soul 
with the help of divine grace and love, receiving the life of God himself in the depths of the soul through grace bestowed through the sacraments, the baptized Christian is able to offer pure religion, pure worship, since the theological virtues attain God directly. There is, therefore, Aquinas notes, a reciprocal, re reciprocal relation between the love of God and the virtue of religion. The more we love God, the more we worship him. The more we worship God, the more we will love him. Aquinas uses an analogy using his medieval biology, which is, I think, funny. He uses the example of the relation between fat and body heat. As body fat is produced by heat, and at the same time thrives on heat, so the love of God produces religion, and at the same time thrives on religion. Fat love of God. Since God is our ultimate happiness, and as Aquinas notes from Aristotle, happiness does not spring from chance, the order to God that religion provides constitutes a fundamental part of our journey to happiness, to beatitude, to deification. The virtue of religion gets at the heart of morality because it has so much to do with order. It properly orders us in our situation of life and it orders us to God, who is our final end. As a virtue, it perfects our interior life and is the source of action that touches upon the human mind and the human heart. It's not surprising that at this point, you will hear that Aquinas' discussion of law has to do a lot with Order. Not like law and order on NBC. Which, although, is more interesting than Aquinas' treatise on law, I think, because it's a little more vivid. Part of the reason why Aquinas' treatise on law is of interest is that it flies in the face of so many modern Western ideals on what law is and what it is meant to do. For starters, Law, Aquinas locates law firmly within the context of the Summa Theologiae, indicating that law fundamentally has to do with God. Another reason why it's so unconventional is that law for Aquinas is inseparable from morality. Whereas today, where we can see that some morally bad things are legal, for example, an organ adultery is legal, and that's not a punishable offense. And we can see that some things are, and we can also see that some things are illegal that are actually morally good. For example, in Medford, Oregon, it is illegal for a group of people to feed the homeless in a public area without a permit. Such separation of morality and legality is hard to reconcile in Thomas's thought. As Mary Keyes remarks in the American Journal of Political Science, quote, Aquinas, in effect, maintains the impossibility of severing human law from moral good and evil, virtue and vice. Those who hold the contrary view, he would argue, lack sufficient consciousness of both the causes of their character and the effects of social and civic practices. <laughs> but yet, Aquinas stands as a dominant figure in the thought of the church on law. Aquinas begins his treatment of law in the Prima Secunde of the Summa after finishing his discussion of the interior principles. The treatise on law is set within the framework of, assist, of God assisting humans and creation from the outside towards their final goal. Law, therefore, begins from God, is moved by God, and moves towards God. Law is, quote, a rule and measure of action. A rule and measure of action. And it moves things towards the common good, that final end. That's why Aquinas says every law is, quote, ordered to the common good. This movement that law produces is described as an ordinum ad fiam activae an active ordering of things towards the ultimate end, carried out within the universe. Since law is this ordering to the end, and the end of human life is happiness with God established in and through virtue, therefore law's primary effect on men is to make them virtuous. Law and morality therefore coincide 
in the task of ordering man and all of creation to God. The task of ordering things to the final common good, of making and enforcing law, finds its origin in God who rules over all. But this task of ordering is shared among lesser beings, namely humans, insofar as they can assist one another in ordering their lives to God. Law for Aquinas exists in a hierarchical order. (laughs) The highest law in the hierarchical order of laws is called the eternal law, which is proper to God alone. The eternal law is basically God's ordering of all things to himself. I'll put these both up. As we said, God orders all things, and he does so through providence and through government. Another name for that is law. God has a plan for all of creation, and that plan has the force of law. The eternal law, as applied to humans in particular, is called the natural law. As we recall, God moves all things according to their nature. And the proper action of a human nature are the virtues, since these perfect human nature, the powers of the soul, and make us more like God, who is our ultimate end in happiness. Since we have a rational nature, we share in God's plan through reason and will, which give life and shape to the virtues. The natural law is how humans cooperate with God's plan of creation. It is the same for all people, since we all share human nature. Thus, we cannot say, murder is right for you, but wrong for me, because we are all humans, bound by the same nature, the same law, and the same lawgiver. But at the same time, different cultures express human nature in different ways. So, the natural law does not necessitate a strict uniformity of custom on all people, but a uniformity of virtue. Yet the natural law cannot be changed by us or our customs, since we do not define ourselves. We do not give ourselves human nature. It comes from God. The natural law is aided by the new law, or the law of the gospel, which, is, which includes scripture, the revelation of Christ. It is, as Aquinas describes it, nothing but the Holy Spirit himself aiding and moving humans towards the end. Now, we could spend a lot of time on natural law, but as J. Bujijewski writes, it's a thick theory, so we'll move on. Unlike the honey badger, the striped-nosed hog skunk, or the giant California sea cucumber, humans do not well trying to live in isolation or in solitude. Part of our human nature is that we are social. We live together. We form clans and groups, just like wolves penguins, and European starlings. We are social animals of a rational nature. And part of the well-being and perfection of a human is that he or she lives in a society that both provides nourishment, protection, and community, as well as offers venues for the perfection of skills, gainful employment, and development as a human person. Because of our natural sociability, Aquinas holds that human government is a natural phenomenon. Unlike those who consider law and government as a necessary evil to reluctantly ameliorate the nasty, short, brutish life of man, Aquinas holds that humans naturally form governments and create laws. Because we live in groups, there must be people whose task it is to care for the group. And this is done effectively by one person, Aquinas says, a king or a monarch. That is why, for example, the preponderance of the Christian tradition has supported monarchies. It's more efficient. It reflects God's monarchy. But we won't get into that here. Aquinas argues, based on our natural sociability, that making laws is natural, normal, and good for humans. There are, of course, exceptions, which we will discuss. But Aquinas argues that since we are social beings, we need help from one another in order not only to have physical and emotional well-being, but also to develop virtues and learn what it means to be a good human being. 
Since no man is an island, we need one another. This is done through the help of human laws, which as rules and measures of action encourage virtue and discourage vice. Law, however, is not meant for just individuals, but for this whole society. For this reason, the goal of law, human law, is to make all people in a society virtuous. Aquinas notes, though, not suddenly, but gradually. Another name for this goal is the human common good, which is when all humans have achieved God through virtue. Human laws, in order to achieve this end, can direct actions regarding both important moral acts, such as murder, adultery, or theft, as well as acts which are, for the most part, morally neutral, but related to the good order and function of the society, such as renewing your driver's license or cleaning your sidewalk. Thus, laws regarding paying taxes or not murdering people, protecting property from destruction or establishing labor safety regulations are at their core, for Aquinas, meant in ways either immediate or remote to promote the well-being and the virtue of all people within a society. Human laws assist people in a society to follow the natural law and to follow the eternal law. Hence, they, it moves towards the final end. Thus, for Aquinas, legality and morality go hand in hand. The question arises, however, as to the authority of human laws, whether all are bound to obey every law made by a king or a human government. Aquinas answers this question by remarking that, quote, laws framed by man are either just or unjust, end quote. What makes a human law just for Aquinas is that it corresponds to the natural law. It corresponds to the eternal law. What makes a law unjust is that it departs from the natural law and the eternal law. Aquinas states that a human law departs the natural and eternal law specifically by either being damaging to the human good, the true human good, or to the divine good. That's important. Such laws, Aquinas says, are not to be obeyed since they do not agree with God's order. Thus, a law that prevents people from achieving human well-being or virtue, that is directed only to the vainglory or lust of the king or rulers, or that burdens people enough to hinder the attainment of the common good, is contrary to the natural and eternal law and should not be obeyed. A law is contrary to the divine good if it induces people to idolatry, or if it is explicitly contrary to the divine law, which, as we remember, comes from Scripture. Human laws that are contrary to the gospel, quote, must in no way be observed, because, as stated in Acts 5.29, we ought to obey God rather than men. Human law is subservient to natural law, which moves people to attain God. Natural law is subservient to the eternal law, which moves humans and all of creation to attain God. Law ultimately orders all things to God because law ultimately comes from God. So what do we take from this? We see that, one, the universe exists as a splendid order. This order is hierarchical and manifested through the diversity of creation. This order is horizontal in that it moves the universe towards a definite end, which is God. This order is harmonious as the fullest manifestation of God's creation at the end of time. And we see, too, that law and religion coincide in ordering humans to God. Law moves from without. Religion moves from within. When law and religion conflict, there is a disorder, a disorder in either human life or in human society, because men and women in that case are not being properly oriented to their greatest and final good. The challenge that this vision of St. Thomas presents us with is to actively work on two fronts. We as Catholics must first of all 
strengthen our sense of worship. If God is truly the Alpha and the Omega of our lives, and if we have received the grace of the crucified Lord, then we must worship God with all our strength so as to praise the Lord at all times. When we do this, we will worship in spirit and truth and properly order our minds and our hearts to Christ. We as Catholics must also work socially and legally to promote the true common good, the ordering of human life to God, both through evangelization and legal channels. The beautiful flaw of the American legal system is, as we see more and more, that really anything can be changed by whoever is the loudest for the longest. It will take the work of the Catholic imagination to find ways to promote the natural law, to seek the common good, and to turn our legal system into one that more closely reflects the wisdom and grace of the gospel. The Church and St. Thomas do not offer us technical solutions to these problems, but they offer us the assurance that God is at work in the world through us who profess his name and who work to spread his kingdom, his government, so that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you.